let's continue what we did last class. I want to show you another treasury bond just so you get a little more practice. You should have seen this in business finance and other classes how to discount a cash flow. But just in case, we'll practice a few times just to make sure you're really comfortable. And be think about what we're doing. Never let this be uh, plug it into the calculator, plug it into Excel. Always think about what do these numbers mean. We talked about duration, we're talking about effective yield, we're talking about discounting cash flows and time, forecasting cash flows. How comfortable are you with each of these concepts and then especially what intuition can you build? I mentioned last class, the lower the discount rate, the higher the duration. Does that make sense to you? The higher the discount rate, the, the lower the duration? Why would that be the case? We'll talk about it again today. Uh, but understanding things like duration and how that is affected by time and by the discount rate, that's really, really, really important. In the corporate bonds, we'll bring in the spread and the spread risk and spread duration, although we won't use spread duration in this class, but just uh, it adds another element of the credit side. And then if we have time, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at the stock market and look at valuing stocks. So last class, we valued a treasury. I want to do it again. This time, what I recommend you try, if you remember from this one, what we did, then when I do this one, I give all the assumptions then see if you can calculate it yourself on your own. So we'll do treasury bond two. So first we have to define the bond. Let's say it's a 30 year treasury issued 10 years, uh, let's say 20 years ago. All right, so a 30 year treasury issued 20 years ago. So I'm going to go out just out of curiosity and see what that interest rate might be. And so I use this daily treasury yield curve. So we're talking about a 30 year bond issued 20 years ago. So 20 years ago would be what? 2001? In the middle of a kind of a crisis with Enron. So let's try 2001. So March of two, 30 years, the very last one. So March, I'm doing this, it's about March 14th. Wow, look at that number, 528. Wow, it's hard to believe. So the coupon, let's just call it 530. Here's our coupon. All right, so what's the term? So it's a 30-year bond issued 10, 20 years ago, so it's a 10-year bond, right? As far as we care, we know it's a 10-year bond. What is the risk-free rate? Well, let's look at 10-year um, treasury, 20-year treasury, and 30-year treasury. So be real clear. Step back and make sure you really sink into what we're talking about here. The coupon, will, when, when the Treasury issues a bond, they're going to issue it with a coupon that's very close, if not exactly the same, as current rates. So essentially, they're going to issue the bond at par. So if interest rates are 530 t 20 years ago, they're going to issue this bond with a coupon of 530. So the coupon and current yields are exactly the same. But we're going to discount it today at today's risk-free rate because we're talking about buying this bond. So let's say 10-year rates. I'm going to just I'm not going to use actual 10-year rates, but I'll I'll get kind of in the ballpark. Let's say 10 years at 1.6, 20 years at 1.8, and 30 years at 2.1. Who knows? We go back to current. Who knows what rates are today? So yeah, I wasn't too close. 1.6. Wow, 230 and 240 but we don't care about those because there's only one rate we care about and that's the 10-year treasury we don't care that it's a 30-year bond because it's not a 30-year bond today today there's only 10 years left so it's a 10-year bond so our risk-free rate is going to be 1.6 percent now what's our spread well again it's a treasury so there's no spread and so what's our, our KD our discount rate 
it's going to be your risk free rate plus a spread. One point six percent, but we need the effective yield. Remember the effective yield. We're going to take one plus KD, and we'll always divide by two. We'll always raise it to the two minus one. So we'll take one plus point zero one six divided by two, raise it to the second minus one. And if you get one point four percent, you did something wrong. It cannot be lower. It's impossible for it to be lower. It shouldn't be a whole lot higher, so if you get 6.8%, you did something wrong. It should be a little bit higher. Now, the higher the number, the higher the difference. So if you're doing 10%, the difference could be a lot bigger than if you're doing 1.6%. So maybe it's 1.61, possibly. It rounds up to 1.61. It's actually 1.606, but it's going to be higher than that rate. All right, so what do you have to do? Well... You have to do the table. We'll set up the table. That's required. What else could you do? So the table, a table is required. What else could you do? Well, I like to do the guess. And the reason I like to do the guess is not because I, I, I want to make sure I have a good, good answer. You know, so I can double check to make sure my answer is reasonable. I like to do the guess just to make sure students understand this equation that we've used. Minus duration times the change in yield should approximate the change in the price of the bond. All right, so let me guess the duration. All right, so remember the last time we had a five-year bond and I guessed the duration at 4.5. Remember if it had been a two-year bond, I probably would have guessed 1.9 or 1.95. A five-year bond, I guess 4.5. On the 10-year bond, I'm going to guess 9.2. We'll figure out what it actually is. Remember, the lower the discount rate, the higher the duration because it's the weighted average time to maturity. Now, the very last cash flow, when you get your $1,000 back, if you have a low discount rate, then the low discount rate is going to give that much more weight. When you discount it, you discount it at a lower weights rate. So if it has it's going to have much more weight. So the, the longer, the lower the discount rate, the more that very final cash flow has more power, more weight. So I'm going to say 9.2. That might be a little low, but on the five-year bond, we went from five and our duration is four and a half, and that was with the low interest rate. So I'm guessing with the 10-year, 9.2. I should know better than that, but I just can't remember. So my guess on the price change is going to be minus duration so minus duration times the change in yield. What's the change in yield? Well, the yield today is 1.6%, but 20 years ago it was 5.3%. So interest rates have fallen a lot since we bought this bond. And so we expect its price to be up 34%. So the guess on the price, I just take $1,000 times one plus that price change, so about $1,300. So I expect this bond to be somewhere around $1,300. Now, we're only using duration. Remember, convexity will add even more, so maybe it's $1,350, $1,360. It depends on how good my duration guess is. And then we'll use the short formula. I love the short formula, not because I'd say you have to have it loaded so that you can double check your answer, though you can do that. I like it because if you understand the present value interest factor of an annuity, or if you've seen that formula, it's essentially that formula with the exception of the $1,000, what we have to do with the $1,000. So essentially what we're going to say is, hey, let's first figure out the coupon payment. So remember the coupon is going to be the face times the coupon rate divided by 2. Why divided by 2? Because bonds pay twice a year. So we'll take $1,000 times 5.3% divided by 2. So our cash flow is $2,650. So the, the short formula is we take our $2,650 and we're going to assume that happens for all of eternity. So we divide by our discount rate. Here we have to take our discount rate divided by 2 because we're getting these twice a year. 
So the value of that $26.50 that we received every six months, if we were to receive that for all of eternity, it would be worth $33.12.50. Now that's just the coupon. We're also going to get the $1,000 back, but in 10 years, we will not get infinity of the $26.50. So we got to subtract infinity of the 2650 after 10 years so we'll just do the exact same formula again b15 divided by b6 divided by 2 and then now if we did this obviously we're going to get exactly one thousand dollars why because we just we took this and then we subtracted this so that's going to equal zero and we added a thousand but what we're going to actually do is take all of this and discount it back to the day. So what is that? That's one plus my discount rate divided by two raised to the 20. There's 20 periods. When I do that, I get a price of 1340. Well, that's really close to my guess. So my duration is probably a little bit high, what we'll see, because expecting with convexity, I would have expected this to be higher. We'll see. We'll see if we did it correctly or not. So there's your second guess. Your third guess, or your third approach, can be your calculator. That's fine. I don't even try it in Excel. I'm sure Excel has the function to value this bond. I just, I just never use it. So to me, you saw that in a couple classes ago when we did standard deviation, beta, correlation. We did it by hand. I, really, I don't know how to encourage you to learn these formulas so that you can do them in Excel by hand. Don't use the functions that you can do them by hand. Make sure your brain knows exactly what the function is doing. If you're constantly using the function in Excel or in your calculator and you're really not sure what they're doing, you don't really understand finance because your, your brain's not wrapping around the actual calculations. And it's those actual calculations which is where our theory is. So you've got to know these formulas. So, You've got three three approaches here to get a good guess. So let's let's try this one. So remember the table. You have time, then you put the cash flow in there, then you have the discount factor, and then you have the discounted cash flow. And if you want to, you can calculate the duration. That's not required on an exam, but if you want to impress me, I've had some students put it on their exam just to show off. I love it when college students show off. Uh, those students you see do extremely well in interviews. Um, so you got the students that say, let me learn exactly what I need for this class and nothing more. I, I, I want to graduate not knowing anything more than exactly what I need for every class. And that's the stressed out student who hasn't had much time and they're just trying to get by. Then there's a student that says, hey, what they teach in class is fine, but I want to go beyond. Go beyond. Push yourself. And that's one good way to do it is, is go ahead and learn cal how to calculate duration now. Don't wait until you take the CFA exam. All right, so on time, we're going 10 years. So we're going to take six months out, and then we'll, we'll take six months out, and we'll add 0.5 to that. And we'll just copy that down. We have 20 periods. So 10 years is going to be 20 cash flows, right? Because we get them every six months. So our first cash flow will be 2650. You can copy that all the way down. Actually, the best way to copy that down is just double click on the corner there. And then that's my cash flow every six months, except for at year 10, we get our $1,000 back. All right. Now, what's my discount factor? My discount factor is going to be one plus the effective rate raised to time. So I'm, I'm sorry, one divided by all of that. All right, so plus one divided by one plus my effective rate, and I've got to lock my effective rate in. Raise the time. And I should get something slightly below one. And I recommend go out four decimal places. The reason we do four decimal places, and if you've seen some of these tables, these present value tables, they go out four decimal places. And that's because we're talking about dollars and cents. Dollars and cents, so cents go out two decimal places. So if you do four decimal places here, you won't have 
rounding issues. And then each factor should be lower all the way down. So what's my discounted cash flow? You just multiply the cash flow by the discount rate and that gives you the present value. And so what is, what is the price of this bond? It's just the sum of those discounted cash flows. And sure enough, I got the right answer. There's my right answer. So for the exam, you're required to give me this answer and you're required to do all of that. This is absolutely required. Well, sorry. This is required. The duration is not required. So that's what's required. You give me this. If all you give me on the exam is this, because you plugged it into your calculator, you get zero points, even if you're right to the penny. All right? If you do this short formula, I might give you a little bit of credit if you show all your work, but you will not get full credit. The only way to get full credit is if you show the entire table. All right? Now, duration. So what do we do with duration? Remember, duration is just time weighted by the discounted cash flows. So you take the discounted cash flows divided by the sum of the discounted cash flows. And that gives you your weighted time to maturity. And so your actual duration is just the sum of those. See how close I got. Oh, wow, I was way off. And I thought I was off. Wow. Now, let me show you again. If the interest rate rises, that duration should fall. So let's go to 20%, and you can see the duration falls dramatically. So, boy, I, 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 I just had bad memory. Um, I, sh I should have known. It is, it is somewhat exponential as you go further in time. The difference between the maturity and the duration gets wider and wider and wider, and I should have known it would be below 9. I'm surprised it's 8.22. But how did I know I, I was way too high on the duration? Is because my guess on the price was so close to the actual price, and there should be some convexity there. So if we use the 8.22, you can see my guess would have been 13.04. That extra 36 bucks, that's the convexity of the bond. All right, so we've priced the treasury now, but you notice I've done more than just price the treasury. I'm constantly inundating you with learn more, learn more, really know it, understand it. So can you conceptually explain why duration falls when we increase our discount rate? If you increase your discount rate, the weight of this last one, look at the weight here, this divided by... That is 65%. So 65% of the, of the cash flow, this discount cash flows is that 10th year. And if we increase our discount rate to 20%, this last cash flow is now only 41%. So that weight on year 10 is much lower the higher the, the, uh, the discount rate, all right? So I remember on the CFA exam, they would ask that question, and boy, I wasn't, it took me a while for my brain to really wrap around why duration falls when interest rates rise. But if you, that's why you see why I have you do the table. When you do the table, Comes pretty obvious. Each one of these is weighted by the cash flow. The higher the discount rate, rate, the lower the weights the later years are going to have because the discounting function was going to reduce those dramatically and the earlier ones will have more weight and so your duration will change and it, it's pretty material, right? If we jump up to 20% it drops down to six years. However, if we just drop jump up to 2% it hardly moves at all. It went from 8.22 to 8.19. So, uh, what if interest rates get back to 4.5%? Duration falls about about 0.25. So, it's, it's there. It's material. It's going to be more material for a 30-year bond than for a 10-year bond. But, it's, it's material. It does have some impact. All right. So, hopefully, if, if you didn't do all this with me, what I recommend you do is just take this, this first part. So, the parts that you're given on the exam is I give you, I don't give you much. I give you that, and I give you that. I tell you, it's a 30-year treasury issued 20 years ago, and its coupon is 5.3%, and I give you some rates, and you got to know which one to pick. If all you had was these 
one, two, three, four, five pieces of data, and two of them you don't even need, could you do everything we did here? All right. Okay, let's keep going. Now we're going to do, we'll do a couple of corporate bonds, but let's do a corporate bond. So with the corporate bond, we only, it's the exact same thing. Nothing changes except for now we need to add a spread. So let's say we have an IBM 20 year bond issued 10 years ago. All right, so what is the, let's get, well, let's get the risk free rate first. So let's let's do um, ten-year Treasury twenty-year Treasury boy I can't type and thirty-year so ten years ago ten years ago was two thousand eleven so let's go to two thousand eleven. Go down to March, so we know it's it's 10, 20, 30. It's the last one's March. I'm on the 14th here, so 10 years ago, 336, 425, and 452. So 3.36%, 4.25%, 4.25%. Now that was 10 years ago, 2011. Now let's do today. What are the what are the rates today? Let's go get the actual rates. So today the numbers are much 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 lower. One point six four percent. 2.31% and 2.4%. All right, and let's do some spreads. Now, one other thing I've got to tell you, this IBM bond was issued 20 years ago, I mean 10 years ago, it's a 20 year bond. Let's say it was rated AAA when issued and is rated single A minus today. So let's do some spreads. Let's do the triple A spread. Let's do the double A, I mean the single A minus spread. Let's say 2011, let's say the spread was uh, 25. Oops, don't want 25. We don't need decimal places. 25 and let's say this was uh, 105 and let's say the day it's 20 and oops same same issue let's say 20 and 95 all right so if I give you all of this information you've got a lot of information now do you know which of this information is not important so I'll tell you the coupon what is likely to be the coupon? Well, 10 years ago this bond was issued and it would have a coupon really close to its current yield. Well, 10 years ago it was a 20 year bond, so the risk free rate would have been 425 and it was AAA rated, so the spread would have been 25. So I'm going to guess that the, the coupon would have been 4.5%. 0.0425 plus 0 0.0025. Plus 4.5%. Now, how do I know that the spread? is 0 0.0025. Remember, you convert from spreads to decimals by taking the, the spread in basis points and dividing by 10,000. All right, so 25 basis points is 0.25% or 0 0.0025. 105 basis points is 1.05% or 0 0.0105. All right, so you just divide by 10,000. So the coupon, I give you the coupon. But you can somewhat back into the coupon just by doing, you know, looking at what the risk-free rate would have been 20, 10 years ago, 
and what uh, the spread would have been 10 years ago. But now, what is the rate today? So we need the risk-free rate. All right, so what is the term? What kind of bond is this? It was issued 10, 10 years ago, and when it was issued, it was 20 years, so that sounds like it's a, it's a 10 year bond. We have 10 years left. So what is my risk free rate? Well, we don't care about this column at all. We're only looking at today. So the 10 year treasury is 1.64%. And what is my spread? Well, it's a 10 year bond. I, I should have done the spreads a little bit better here. Um, let, me, let me do it a little better. Let's do the spread for a 10 year and the AAA spread, well then let's say for a 20 year and it's AAA spread for a 10 year, single A spread for a 20 year, and a, 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 I'm sorry, A minus spread for a 20 year, A minus spread for a 10 year. So let's say this is 20, ah, come on Bill Gates. So let's say this is 20 and 15, and let's say this is 190. All right. That's what remember we talked about the term structure of credit spreads. Now we may not have talked about it, but there is a term structure. Remember, term structure just means how do rates change given different maturities. So we know the yield curve has a term structure. Longer term rates are, tend to be higher than shorter term rates. That's for the risk-free rate. The same thing is true with credit spreads. Longer term bonds have higher spreads than shorter term bonds. So the 20 year should have a higher spread than, than the 10 year. All right. So when, we, when the bond was issued, that would have been the risk-free rate and that would have been the spread. Why? Because when it was issued as a 20-year bond, and it was AAA rated in 20 years. Today, it is a 10-year bond, and it is single, single A rated, or A minus rated. So, A minus rated. So, what is my spread? We're going to take 90 divided by 10,000. So, there's my spread. 90 basis points and so my KD or my discount rate is just going to be the risk free rate plus the spread or 2.54 percent. What's the effective yield? You know it's going to be somewhere around 256, 257 but let's just try it. You take 1 plus the discount rate divided by 2 Raise it to 2 minus 1. We do that, we get 256, 2.56%. All right, so we have everything. At this point, it's exactly what we did with the treasuries. Absolutely nothing changes. And you know on the exam, I'm not going to give you a treasury. I will give you a corporate because there's more pieces and it's, it's more interesting. But at this point, there's only one thing we had to do differently, and that was to get the spread. Now, I give you four number. I give you eight numbers, and you got to figure out which one to use. I really didn't use anything in this column because I gave you the coupon. This is a given. So these two things are given, and it's possible it won't match because this 25 is the average spread for AAA. It may not equate to IBM. IBM might be 23 or 26 or something like that, but I made it exactly the same there. All right, and then today, we all we care about is the numbers today, and all we care about that it's 10 years, and it's A minus. So 10 years, A minus, it's 164 and 90. If you get that, everything else is exactly the same as what we did with the treasuries. So let's start with the guess. So guess duration, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Let's say the duration is 8.1 years. The guess on um, the price change again we're going to use minus duration times the change in yields hopefully you've already done this and you're ahead of me on this so minus duration times how did yields change 
Well, today they're 254. Use the KD, not the effective rate. They were 450 when this bond was issued, so interest rates have fallen about 200 basis points. We're looking like 16.3% or 16% or so. We expect this bond to be up, so the guess in bond price is going to be $1,000 times 1 plus that, so about 11.5876. That's my guess. All right. Then we'll use the short formula. So remember on that, it's pretty, well, let's, let's get the coupon first, the coupon payment. So remember here, you're going to take the face times the coupon divided by two. We always, we always assume that the face is a thousand dollars. So just, this is normal thousand dollars times the coupon divided by two. I should get twenty-two dollars and fifty cents every six months right so the short formula what does it say take that cash flow and let's assume we get it for all of eternity so we take the discount rate divided by the discount rate divided by two plus we'll get our thousand dollars back plus that exact same thing just type it again b6 divided by two i don't know why i have so many decimal places we're going to discount all of that today, so 1 plus my discount rate divided by 2 to whatever my term is, 10 years times 2, because we have two payments a year. Oh, you see my one error, I said plus there, I just said minus, so we have the coupon for all of Affinity not discounted and then all of this discounted from 10 years out why do we discount the thousand dollars that we get back but then we subtract out the infinity of the coupon when we do that we get this price that looks like that's about right doesn't it what's the difference duration says it's 1158 the short formula the actual number is 1172 the difference in that is convexity this bond has some convexity we'll see my duration might be a little bit high but we'll see I don't think it's too far off. All right, and so down here we do the we do the the table. We have the time. We have the cash flow. Hopefully, this is getting really easy. The discount factor, the discounted cash flow, and then if you want to, you can do the duration calculation. Again, time we start at month six, so that's half a year. Just add 0.5. We need to go down 10 periods. Didn't quite make it, but down 10 periods. I'm gonna. One thing, you know, anytime you do a table like this, always get your decimals in the same. We don't. I see students that go out like 40 decimals in places. You always, always format. Don't, don't turn in anything that's not formatted. All right, so what's my cash flow? It's $22.50. I'll lock that in, and then I can just copy that down. That's my cash flow, except for what? I get my $1,000 back at the end. All right, what's my discount factor? It's the same thing as before. One divided by one plus. Here we use the effective yield. This is the only place we use the effective yield. you got to lock that in. Close parentheses. Raise it through time. Practice this over and over again. The biggest mistake students make is they don't get the parentheses in the right place. The other mistake they make is they, they don't realize this number should be slightly below 1. So they get 1.623 or get 0.231 or something. And that's what I say. You know, as a finance student, you need to do it like this so you start getting used to what's normal. I have students that don't know when they should be shocked that the number is obviously wrong. They have an obviously wrong number and they go with it. They don't change anything, and that's a bad sign. That's when a student's preparing for a multiple choice question and not preparing for life. you gotta, got to know what this stuff is, what's normal, what makes sense. All right, so let's copy that down. And so that gives me a price. Let's see how, if, how well I did on the short formula. Gives me a price exactly the same. And then if you want to, you can try it on a calculator. So you can get the exact same answer on the calculator. Now let's let's try duration. 
I think my duration might be a little bit high, but we'll see. So we just take time times the discounted cash flow, the weighted discounted cash flow. So we take each discounted cash flow divided by the sum, those which is the price. We copy that down. And so our actual duration, this is Macaulay duration, it's not modified. Modified is going to be slightly lower than that. Oh, my duration is actually higher. I'm kind of surprised. So it's actually 8.33. So not as, not as much convexity as I was expecting. But 11.63 was my guess. The actual number was 11.72. 11.72, I got that twice. Now, on the exam, you're going to be time constrained. So if I were you on the exam, I would start with the table. Get the table down. Don't do duration. Don't do the formula. Don't do the guess. But if you finish, you know, if I give you 20 minutes to do the problem and you finish in 10 minutes, then add all that other stuff. Why not? Why not try all that other stuff and, and you know, just get into practice. So you might be doing all this other stuff to make sure your answer is correct, and that's fine. But even more important, do all the other stuff. You can see how powerful this is. Just if you can understand what I'm doing here on the guess, you understand this better than 90% of finance majors, undergraduate finance majors in the U.S., and probably 90% of graduates finance majors. Uh, if you understand this formula, what I was doing, you you're better than you're better off than 98% of finance majors when it comes to understanding how bonds are priced. So allow yourself um, some opportunity to get deeper into this analysis so you really, really understand it. All right, let me do one more because I want you to this time pause the video. Once I give you all the assumptions, I want you to then pause the video and then I want you to do, do the analysis. Now on the exam, I, I historically on the exam I've only given two-year bonds because students were calculating it by hand. Um, but I I think on the exam I might I might give you a five or ten or twenty year bond because if you can do this in Excel and we might as well start doing these exams required in Excel that you actually submit them in Excel. Uh, I'll send out multiple versions so that you know, students don't get get any kind of uh, temptation to share files among themselves, but we'll see. You know, I can create 60 different questions pretty easily and, and grade them pretty quickly. So, you know, everybody can have their own unique question. That's the advantage of everything electronically. So, the, the videos, the old videos I have, like the exam review videos, they only do a two-year bond. And so, um, you know, don't over-practice the two-year bond. Make sure you can go further than that. So let's let's try a radical bond. Let's do a um, a um, well. This doesn't really exist, but we'll do it. <laughs> a um, fifty-year bond issued twenty years ago. It was double A rated at issuance. And it's triple B minus rated today. All right, I'm going to copy the stuff from the other page just so I can get it in here. All right, so we've got a 20 year bond, a 30 year bond, a 50 year bond. We got a spread for 50 years, a spread for 30 years, spread for 50 years, spread for 30 years. This was at issuance was double A, and today it's triple B minus. And who knows what interest rates were, because there are no 50-year bonds. Really, there might be. A couple of corporates like that. Now there are some countries, and there are I think Argentina has tried this. I forget which countries. There are some countries that are trying infinite bonds. So remember, I talked about that coupon. If that coupon went on for all of infinity, 
there actually are governments that are issuing infinity bonds that have no maturity. They just keep paying the coupon over and over and over again forever and ever and ever. Those bonds are much easier to price than the ones we're doing because then you just take the cash flow divided by the discount rate. Very, very simple. So let's let's say, wow, um, we're talking 20 years ago, so that's uh, 2001, right? And so, wow, 2001 rates were much higher, so we'll say 4.25, 4.6, we'll keep We'll keep the spreads, we'll, we'll raise them a little bit. Well, no, probably a lot more, because 2001 was in the middle of the Enron f fiasco. Oh, even more, These are, this is a double A bond, triple B, probably 210 back then. And today, probably 35, 30, uh, 1, boy, 180, and 170. We'll just go with that. All right. So I got to give you the coupon. And once I give you the coupon, you can hit pause and calculate this entire bond. And so I'm going to say the coupon was 585. All right, so there's a coupon. So if you want to hit pause, this is what I'll give you on the exam. You hit pause, put your stopwatch on, and see how fast you can do this entire problem. Okay, so you work the problem. So let's try this. What is our term here? Our term is 30 years. All right. And so let's get the risk-free rate. I probably should have changed my risk-free rates for the day, but that's okay. My risk-free rate, well, it is a 30-year bonds, and it's today. So my risk-free rate is going to be 2.31%. What is my spread? Well, it's triple, triple B minus today, and there's 30 years left. So I'm going to use 231, and I'm going to use 170. So my spread is going to be 170 divided by 10,000. So my spread will be 1.7%. And so my KD, my discount rate, is going to be the sum of those two. So 4%. So rates have fallen, but not as much. Why have they not fallen as much? Well, because our spreads went from 60 basis points to 170. So while interest rates dropped, from 525 to 231, the risk-free rate dropped a bunch, but my spread gapped out. And we talked about that in class. As you have those scenarios, the risk-free rate is falling, but spreads are widening. And this this one, the spreads widened because they were downgraded. So interest rates didn't fall as much as it looks like. Even though the risk-free rate fell almost 300 basis points, the discount rate only fell about half of that, a little bit more than half of that. Now my effective yield, We'll take 1 plus that divided by 2. Hopefully you got this down. Minus 1 should be like 404 or something, 405. So 405, almost exactly 405. All right, I'm going to do the guess. Guess duration. Wow, 30. Okay, this one gets tough, and boy, I do not know. Uh, with 4%. I'm going to guess 18, but we'll see. I'm probably going to be way off on that. But we'll see. 18 years. My guess on price change. I'll do minus duration times. My interest rate today is 401. I started off at 585. So I'm going to guess at 33%. Now that may seem really, really high, but this is a 30-year bond, so it's going to be much, much more sensitive. My guess on the price is going to be a thousand dollars times. One plus that. So that's my guess. We'll see. If I'm off, it's going to be because of that 1800. So th we'll do the short formula. First, we got to get the coupon payment. That's going to be $1,000 times 5.85% divided by 2. Oops. Sorry. I have, have sticky, sticky keys. So that's. $29.25. So my short formula, let's see if I can get it the first try, 29 
divided by my discount rate divided by 2. So that's the value of that $29.25 forever. And then I add to that $1,000 minus all of that B17 divided by B7 divided by 2. Just repeat all of that and take all of that and discount it to the day. So 1 plus my discount rate divided by 2 raised to, wow, here it's going to be 60, right? Because it's 30 years. That gives me, and so my duration is probably, wow, it's too high, actually. It's, boy, it's hard for me to guess on the 30 year. We'll see. We'll figure it out. All right. And then you can also use your calculator if you want to. Or Excel, you know, either one. You know, the formulas are there. All right. So let's try it. So we've got, hopefully you got this down, the cash flow, the discount factor discounted cash flow and here we've got to do the duration calc I just got to see why I'm so far off on duration you, you notice that duration gets further away from maturity the higher but and it's not in any way linear it's it's pretty skewed so for 10 years for for two years we go down to like 1.9 for five years we went to four and a half for 10 years we went down to like 8.2 8.3 so for 30 years, it, you know, it's going to be much, much shorter. So here we do six months, and then we got to do that plus 0.5. And we got to go down 60. I'm on line 22, so we'll go down to line 80-something. There's my 30, 30 years or 60 payments. So our cash flow is the 29.25. We're going to copy that down. But then the very, very last cash flow will add $1,000. And then my discount factor, exactly what we did before. Nothing changes that plus one divided by one plus, except for make sure you use the effective yield here. Make sure you lock it in. Raise to the time. I'm always amazed students that just bomb this on the exam and it's like, did they practice at all? You should practice this so you just there's no way you'll miss it on the exam you do it so many times it's just second nature and so you take your cash flow times your factor copy that down and so that's going to give me a price equals sum 13.19.41 it worked now what do you notice here the weight of this very last cash flow remember it's like 60 percent or so in the previous one here it's only 24%. That's why the duration comes down so much. Even though you're getting your $1,000 back at year 30, your discount factor is 0.3. So it's not going to have much weight. But let's let's do the duration count because I'm really curious now. So time times the weight of the cash flow is so the 28 divided by the price. We'll copy that down. So let's do equal sum. So it was only 16. So boy, I missed it by ways there. So if I do that, I get 1301 versus 1319. So that makes more sense. I probably won't give you a 30-year bond um, on the exam, but I might give you a five or 10-year just so you can get some Excel practice. But hopefully this all makes sense to you and it's it's all coming together because this is finance. Not only is this finance, but when you interview for jobs, they just assume you can do all of this. So, you know, duration, maybe not as much. So learn duration um, just so you have an edge over other people entering for interviewing for jobs. But all of this, you should know how to use the minus duration times change in yield formula. There it is right there. So in doing these four problems, you got four practices. And using that formula, you, you got practice in using the short formula, which is essentially the present value interest factor of an annuity but excluding the, the $1,000. You got the table, so you see exactly what the discounted cash flow, what, 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 the, what your calculator is doing. Everything is there. You understand uh, risk-free rates and spreads, 
and how spreads change over time and which one to use, what kind of bond is this, it's all in there. So, um, yeah, make sure you know it backwards and forwards. If you are a finance major, this should be something you can do in a net. You shouldn't have to look anything up. You should have to look at formulas. You should be able to do everything I just did in this spreadsheet. You should do with a blank. You know, if I, I gave you what? I gave you this and this table. You should be able to, with a blank Excel spreadsheet, do everything I just did and do it in other, under five minutes. The entire thing in under five, five minutes. So time yourself and see. Some students say, wow, Professor Sweet, you're really fast in Excel. If you're one of the students saying, wow, you're really fast in Excel, Professor Sweet, then I can tell you, tell you, you are not fast enough in Excel. The students, there's a lot of students, they start off in freshman, sophomore year, really impressed with how my Excel skills are. By the time they graduate, because they use so much Excel, they think I'm rather slow. That there's shortcuts I should be using, I'm not, and that's because I'm not using Excel every day on a job. You're going to get really good in Excel and Python and Visual Basic and SQL and, and R and all these kind of things. You're going to get strong on those. I'm becoming a little bit of a dinosaur just because I don't do this on the job. On the job, you just do it so much more. So get, get fast. Get better at, at this stuff. So now we want to switch gears and we want to talk about stocks. And I, I like the way Dr. Demodaran talks about how to value a stock. Now, in your project... Your paper's three and four. Paper three, you gotta come up with a discount rate, so we'll talk about that. Paper four, you take that discount rate and you value the stock, and I'll show you how to do that. But what Dr. Demer Darren says is, the way you value a stock is, you've gotta essentially break the firm into two pieces. One is, you got the cash flows from the existing assets. So that's their kind of normalized current returns. That's like Walmart if they never built another store. It's, um, it's Nike if they never went to China and started expanding into China. Or Walmart if they didn't expand into Latin America. So the existing assets without anything new. So what's the value of those existing assets? Just a business as is. I'm actually going to show you a formula I like to use to determine that, Dr. Demodaran does not like the formula that I use. I've heard him badmouth it, not because I use it. He doesn't know who I am, but he's talked about a formula almost exactly what I'm using, and he, he disagrees. I'll tell you why I disagree with his disagreement of mine, but one of the models we'll use really is trying to do this, trying to value the firm as is. The next thing was well, actually three parts here. The next part is the value of growth expansion. What are they going to do to expand the business? So reinvesting in the business, um, the net effect will determine the value of growth. So what is that value of extra growth? So he looks at what they're reinvesting in the firm. And then the very last thing is steady state. At some point, you take what they're currently doing plus what new they do, and then they come to a steady state. They just they can't add anything new. They've saturated their market. They're everywhere they're going to be. If they build a new store, they're going to be tearing down an old store or closing down an old store. Um, they've already gone globally, as global as they can be. They're just, they're there. It might be like Campbell's Soup or Coca-Cola, although those firms are trying to expand by, you know, buying other, other brands, but it's hard for them to really expand. They're pretty saturated in what they do. Uh, maybe China, maybe India, but even Coca-Cola and you know McDonald's are pretty pretty global companies. So there may be some firms out there that are already at their steady date state today. Their cash flow from existing assets is their steady state because they don't have any growth assets. So he says we value those, and that's what he's talking about here. And then the last thing you have is the risk, and the risk is captured through your discount factor using beta. So exactly what we're going to do, we're going to do it slightly different than, than this. We're going to use some simplified formulas. In my security analysis class, we will actually try this formula and try to value the firm with this exact formula. But in this class, we're going to do it a little bit more simplified. So the intrinsic value is simple. It's really not that complex. We make it complex by overthinking it for cash flows, Cash flow generating assets, the intrinsic value will be 
the magnitude of expected cash flows on the asset over its lifetime and the uncertainty as measured through the discount rate. Um, the it proposition is if it does not affect cash flows or alter risk, don't value it. So some people talk about, wow, they've got some synergies, um, they got the Elon Musk factor that you got to bring in or the Warren Buffett factor. That's fine. But if you already have Elon Musk and Warren Buff in your cash flows, if it's already there, don't add the it factor, the extra factor in and say, well, I'm going to add another 10% because of Elon Musk. Well, no, put that into your forecast of cash flows. What is he going to do that's going to increase the cash flows? You don't add a premium just because Elon Musk is sitting there. You put the Elon Musk into your cash flow. The dub proposition for an asset to have value, the expected cash flows have to be positive sometime over the life of the asset. Um, there are some businesses like Uber that people are really excited about. Wow, there's a lot of growth here, but they have negative cash flows. They've got to spend more than they're bringing in. I really worry about Netflix. I know the stock market the market loves Netflix, but my word, they're they're cash negative and seriously cash negative. I don't know. The last time I've checked on uh, Netflix, I'll, I'll, I'll type it in really quickly here, but boy, um, pretty amazing. Um, pretty amazing the cash flow. I know they're trying to trying to uh, do all this new this new um, programming, and they say, "Well, that's really important." So probably is, but the new programming. What is it going to do? You know, their cash from operations uh, this year finally went positive. So that's that's pretty pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. But for the longest time, their cash, their operating cash flows were negative two, three billion dollars. Um, so they were spending a lot. So now it's positive, but are the, is it positive enough that it's going to make up for the tens of billions of dollars they've been investing? I would guess this last year their cash from operation was probably positive because of COVID. Because of COVID, they could not actually produce programming. I've seen some articles on that. So it may be possible once COVID's over that you might actually see another large negative cash flow when they can finally actually start doing production again. And so we'll, we'll see. But yeah, for Netflix is doing all this new program what, to, for what? To get new users? How many new users are they going to get? I saw an article that Netflix might actually clamp down on people sharing passwords. That would be interesting to see how their customers actually react to that. But they, they've got to get a good growth in customers. So if they're spending $10 billion over a matter of three or four years to produce new programming, they got to make that up somehow with, with new users. And so, yeah, it's interesting. So they're going to somehow get positive. They can't be spending more on new programming than they're bringing in new customers. And then the don't freak out proposition assets that generate cash flows early in their life will be worth more than cash flows that generate cash flows later. That's just the time value money. The latter may, however, have greater growth. So, you know, it's exactly what we do with bonds. With the bonds, we lined up the cash flows and we discounted them. If the maturity was in 10 years, then that maturity value is more valuable to us than if the maturity was in 30 years. So it's not radically different. The big difference between stocks and bonds is with the, with the bond, it's a contractual cash flow. You know exactly what you're going to get and it's not going to grow. It's not going to change. It's not like the treasury is going to pay you 2% and say, hey, we're having a really good year. We're collecting all our tax. We're going to increase what we pay you to 2.5%. But with stocks, the amount that you get paid can grow at a pretty significant rate, at a good growth rate. So that's what valuing stocks is. It's not radically different than what we did with bonds. So we'll get into this. You have the most difficult thing for paper four is what are your growth rates? Because in paper three, you'll come up with your discount rate. In paper four, you'll get the dividend and the earnings. And then all you have to figure out is how fast is that going to grow? So we'll spend some time at the beginning of the next class. I'll talk to you about ways you can figure out growth rates that are reasonable for your, your company and, and how you value them. So we'll, we'll stop there. 
hopefully you pause this video and you got that that corporate bond the price and you it worked perfectly the first time you did it in under 10 minutes and maybe even getting to under five minutes um, so we'll see if we can do the same thing with stocks